joining us today. Um, I'm Sarah Slater. I'm the VP of Music and Festivals at Ticketmaster UK. And I'm really happy to be chairing this panel today on our grassroots venues. Um, we all know how um, vital these venues are to our industry and how imperative it is that we can do all that we can to assist them. So what is being done or not, both by governments, decision makers and industry organisations, and what can we do now? Then what does the future look like? How do we get fans back to enjoying live entertainment at grassroots venue? How does live entertainment work with social distancing in what are usually small venues? To help us navigate through this and expand, I'm joined by our wonderful panel today, who I'm going to pass over to introduce themselves uh, and give us a brief outline of what the position is of their organisation, company or venue, and the current climate, the COVID climate in their country. So again, there we are, lots of lovely faces. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. So I'm just going to go like in the order that I can see you and then um, everyone can just jump in. So, Mark, do you want to do you want to go first with a little introduction? Yeah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, Music Venue Trust is uh, a registered charity operating in the United Kingdom. Um, we have just under 800 uh, grassroots music venue members. Um, and um, we are basically um, at the moment we're organizing uh, those members to be able to respond to all kind of government opportunities um, and we're doing a lot of work with government to make sure that they get um, get a good deal out of that that their concerns are aired and um, yeah there's a hell of a lot of work going on okay uh Carsten? Yeah, hi everybody. So this is Carsten from Hamburg, Germany, and I'm uh, vice president of uh, Livecom, the German uh, grassroots venue network. It existed for 10 years now, and uh, some five years ago, we also took in some 150 medium sized, small and medium sized festivals. So we are speaking about around 900, probably 1,000 members. Uh, half of them is festivals and the other half is uh, grassroots venues. And uh, we are definitely working hard in the moment to get uh, as much money as possible to get the grassroots venues back to life. Cool, thank you. And Katie? Oh, you're, you're on mute. There we are. Good. So my name is Katie. I'm here from uh, Dachstock, Reitschule Bern, which is a independent, autonom, alternative cultural space in the middle of uh, the city of Bern. We um, route back to, we've been squatted in, we squatted the place in the 80s. Well, not we, but the generation up front. And we are mainly a basic democratic um, collective. Um, our room, which is the biggest cultural room in the whole building, fits up to 700, 750, 700-ish capacity. We are doing concerts mainly and also nights with DJs. Excellent. Thank you. And Moose? You're on mute you're on as well, Moose. Yeah. Sorry, first, first day on the internet. Um, I'm Moose, I'm the uh, managing partner at Marauder and we are a music marketing firm out of New York. We run independent venue week throughout the US and uh, recently helped launch the creation of NEVA, National Independent Venue Association, the first organization of its kind representing American independent venues and promoters. Cool, thank you. And Louis? Hi everybody, uh, I'm uh, Luis uh, from Barcelona. Uh, I'm uh, currently manager of uh, Rasmataz. Rasmataz is a big venue in, in Barcelona. It's a, a more than a 2000 capacity uh, venue with five different rooms. Uh, and uh, we have a, 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 um, a music promoter company called uh, Miles Away, and we organize tours for uh, the, the whole country in Spain. And I am also the president of the Catalan Concert Venues Association and vice president of the Catalan Music Academy. And, and 
Nowadays, uh, we are trying to achieve a real interlocution uh, with authorities in order to avoid they make laws and regulations that have to be modified later because uh, uh, they, they don't have uh, uh, the knowledge about our sector and, and I think it is very important uh, to have this interlocution. Thank you. That's great, thank you. Um, so, on to um, our first discussion point. So, the governments in each of your countries and territories, um, what, are they do, what are they doing to help? Have they offered any help, if anything? Um, and what has been, I know that a lot of you have been doing a lot of lobbying um, and, you know, campaigning for these venues. What kind of response have you been um, getting back? So I think we'll go to Moose first. For... Fantastic. Call on the person without an active government. Um, yeah. we, uh, so so I, I think that uh, it's, it's no secret that our government doesn't even agree with itself these days. And certainly is having issues um, on a uh, broader scale than just music venues. Um, when, uh, when, when, when the shutdown happened and when the government lo local government started shutting down the venues, uh, the non-existence of an organization on this level really pointed out the uh, weakness of the sector in being able to properly address something on this scale. Uh, certainly, speaking on a commercial level, not having that organized voice has other ramifications, but in a time of crisis, uh, it was um, very very obvious that there was nobody on Capitol Hill fighting on the venues and the, the independent venues behalf. Um, the very first thing we did as an organization was we hired a lobbying firm to rectify that. And we're working with Aiken Gump, uh, who is probably one of the heaviest hitters as far as lobbying firms go. And we have been rallying the troops in trying to get people active. We started the Save Our Stages campaign. We submitted a letter to both the House of Representatives and to the Senate, um, having uh, over 100 supporters for the um, letter that went to the House, and I believe over 50 supporters for the letter uh, going to the Senate. We had over half a million letters that have been submitted to Congress. Uh, we have hundreds of millions of, um, of uh, fans being reached through the artists that have been supporting. These are, um, you know, everything from, uh, you know, Bonnie Raitt to Foo Fighters to Wyclef Jean, um, Billie Eilish. And uh, we've not yet had that tangible piece of legislation that allows us to really properly celebrate because we as a country haven't had the structure to be able just to go to somebody's you know door and knock on it and say hey remember us you work with us throughout the the year and um we were left out of consideration as these um uh, programs were being passed so we're starting completely from scratch mm -hmm. fortunately for us there uh, you know music is the unifier and so everybody has their their own story. Every senator, every 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 representative has their own story about their own memory at these venues, and some of them have go back a hundred years or so. Um, it's been easier to start that conversation, and we're hopeful that this turns into government action that will help save the venues that the government themselves have forced close. Yeah, I mean. What what about everyone else? I mean, I mean, Mark. Obviously, I'm I'm really aware of like the work that the Music Venues Trust does, um, and the others after speaking to you this week. I mean, does it get any easier um, getting a response from the government or getting anything out of the government with it when you've been established for maybe a little while longer than Moosey's organisation? I mean, what's have been the responses um, to your, to you guys? Um, Mark, should we go to you? Yeah, I guess I guess it's easier to get in the room because you're a known entity and because, I mean, we've been in the room arguing with government for the last six years, it feels like. Oh, it's probably longer than that. Is it six years? Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, that part of it is definitely easier. I don't think anybody should underestimate the kind of pressures and stresses that government are under. Um, you know, it's very easy for us in our sector to, to have a very clear understanding of how tough things are for music venues how tough they are for musicians, for crew, everything like that. Um, we are a, still a special interest group. We're a very big one. But, I mean, actually what we found is the lines of communication are open, but 
at the moment, uh, up until now, the government has generally in the UK been dealing with an outbreak. It's like a game of whack-a-mole, you know, they're trying to hit as many moles as they possibly can. Um, but frankly, they haven't really hit the one that particularly concerns our sector on the head yet. Um, we've had some success in getting them to vary general things that they wanted to do so that so that music venues were included in those. Um, not in every case, but we, we've had some success with that. Um, and then I would say that we've had um, a lot of success in galvanizing the sector to really kind of the same stuff that Moose was talking about there. We, we've been managed to get artists galvanized to speak for the sector. Um, we've managed to get very sp specific artists working to try and generate money for venues to get them through this period. The conversation now is really moving on to what can we specifically get for the sector as things change um, so that they're not dealing with a general thing. So in the UK, sectors are starting to emerge from lockdown. We're seeing proposals that bars and restaurants might be able to open restricted circumstances. We've seen some opening of schools, although that's highly subjective, whether that's worth doing. Um, we are now moving into a point where perhaps the fact that we have a relationship and that we go to, I'm going to three meetings a day with, with government, believe it or not. I've got one immediately after this. Maybe as we come into the point where they can deal with sectors specifically rather than a general big problem, a great big crisis, that's the point at which that may be an advantage. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, I mean, um, Carsten, we were we were chatting earlier. I mean, you've seen some success. Do you want, yes, you know, do you want yes. to tell us through? Yeah, your big, your, your big reveal. <laughs> As the Germans are always the Musterschüler, I don't know. Um, so uh, yeah, last night they decided to have this uh, special interest help for the grassroots venues and the um, small festivals we represent. And so this means we were going to get this, un incredible, this incredible amount of money of 150 million. So they haven't, they haven't really put everything down to paper, but so far as I'm informed, we begin, we're going to have 50 million for the grassroots venues, uh, another 25 million for uh, upcoming programs to, to get them back into life or to, to bring back society into the life with our help. And then another, another 50 million for the small festivals and some 25 millions where I don't know where they are something like ending up, but I guess it's going to be some kind of new start program with it. So what we did for the last two months was that we started with um, some 20, 30, 40 millions. We guessed that we would need if the stages shouldn't close down forever. And we put high pressure on the, on the government in Germany. And after we realized that this won't be over after three months, uh, we certainly re realized that we have to double or even triple these amounts. And in the end, it, uh, it, it was something like very clear that if they want to keep these small stages uh, alive, that they have to react uh, immediately because uh, everybody has um, broke down turnovers to zero and all the economic programs they they were discussing they started with some 20 percent uh, you have to bring in yourself or you have to bring uh, your own money within and all these kind of economic programs which you can't deal with when your 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 march in in, in the club is just one percent and you can can cannot make any debts at all so uh, this led us uh, in the discussions to the, to the right path and uh, finally we made our way into the cultural ministry of Germany and that's where we finally ended up although in the last uh, four weeks I was very unsecure if we can make it because it was so much pressure from all the other kind of uh, um, places like like uh, uh, pubs and bars and stuff and everybody was saying that they were the first to had been closing down and the last to get open again but this was original our first argument and so this is something like a very big deal last night and um, I'm still wondering if it's real, but I hope it is real. And then uh, our focus is going to be in the next 12 months to to get this kind of um, duty with it. It's, it's not just the money. You also get the responsibility to bring back music on stages to, to realize how you can reopen after this very, very intense step back. And there's another thing happened yesterday in Germany is that they reduced the VAT for everybody on 3%, which is the biggest ever done economic uh, help. Um, so this is another big thing for everybody who's selling beer and stuff. And so uh, from, from our point of view, um, we've done, uh, or the German government has probably done this homework yesterday. 
and I'm very, very, how you say, um, yeah, uh, nervous if everything works out fine. <laughs> so. I think everyone, there's quite a few people in the comments asking, you know, to move to Germany. That's <laughs> it. We're all moving to Germany. I give, I give up. So I welcome having the same stress points Karsten's having right now. They sound horrible. How do I spend the money? You know? Yeah. <laughs> That's really good news. That... <laughs> it's so much money that you cannot something like think about it so that's that's when we had programs with one million or even I, I thought this is for for eternity so but but this is something like without any imagination of what it means so that's yeah. a lot of work and a lot of responsibility i i just i just hope that somebody some politician in the uk has accidentally stumbled into this conversation and realizes <laughs> that perhaps if germany's prepared to put in i, I calculate that to be 150 million carson is that correct yeah, 150 million euros, 50 million directly into grassroots. Luis, what do you think about that? <laughs> Kathy, Kathy, what do you think about that? <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. I, 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 only, I only can congratulate <laughs> to Germany because uh, I think this is this kind of things are absolutely impossible in Spain. I don't know. I don't know. I would like it, but I don't know. You've had you've had some success though, have you haven't you, Louis? Or have you had any 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 help from the government for the venues or uh, none? Uh, sorry. Have you had any help from your yeah, yeah. Like state? We have helps, but but uh, in, in Spain we have a, a big problem with the, the, the conception of music as a cultural fact. Uh, 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 most people uh, don't think that music, live music, and especially clubs and electronic music are something uh, to do with culture and are only leisure and entertainment. And uh, well, it, it is not easy to 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 make understand people that we are part of an active part of your culture, and culture have to be supported and have to be promoted. And uh, so when we have these kind of problems, uh, well, uh, comparing with another parts of the culture, theater, uh, cinema and uh, uh, classical music and all these kind of things, uh, we, we have several problems to get funds. Yeah, we have funds, uh, but for instance, uh, now we, we, we achieved last week uh, uh, special fundings for musicians and for uh, the, the, the technical uh, staff with intermittent jobs because uh, you know uh, uh, we're in Spain um, there are a lot of people who work uh, with these intermittents and uh, the first uh, helps don't uh, or did not uh, consider these kind of jobs and uh, most of the artists, musicians, technicians would not uh, get any kind of help, any yeah. kind at all, absolutely nothing. So uh, now Catalan government has uh, opened a, a subsidy for 5 million euros uh, with a maximum of uh, 1,000 euros each people, each person. But uh, now, well, we, we have something, but but uh, the, the, the thing is maybe the idea about music in in spain that is not the best yeah i think that that leads us on um quite nicely and katie i'll, go, I'll come to, to to you next and you know about what what the government in um switzerland have been doing but also um really like just picking up on what louis was saying then is it's not you know this is not just about the buildings right it's not just about those that you know the shells i know they're not shells are you know very important places but you know there's a human element to this as well you know it's people's livelihoods you know it's their businesses in some instances it's even you know where they reside and live um i mean it, how is it over with you guys is there been any government support for not just the buildings but the people that work within the industry and work in the businesses um yes i well i i don't like um making praises on the government in general it's full of politicians <laughs> um but even i was aware about it before but not completely but then i mean of course we're not happy happy here but we we get help and it's not that bad um we have just to, to put it in numbers and it was a fight at the beginning or at least we think it was um we get um 
the government made a package of at the moment. I mean, they made very quick pa packages for the whole economy and the whole country for everybody, which is up to 60, what's that? Let me see, milliarden, that's billions, right? 60 billions, billions, milliarden? Of yeah, billion. English, you say billion. Yeah, that's a lot. Right. So the overall package for economy is 60 billions in Switzerland, I think, up to now. And in there is a package of 280 millions for culture in this whole variation. And in this 60 million billion package is also um, like we have a program which is called Kurzarbeit. You would um, translate that to short term working. That means people who are put out of job are getting employed people were putting out of job because they've been grounded they are guaranteed 80 percent of their normal salary that goes to everybody and they extend it that's an old program it's nothing new it's just never been used in that range of course and they very quickly um extended the whole package because it was um more built for normal economy jobs so they extended it also for smaller jobs part-time jobs which of course includes a lot of people working in the cultural sec cultural club life menu sector so and so i said we have 280 millions just going into cultural help which is um at least 100 million out of that is going into like a quick help into non-profit cultural organization 10 min let me see it's 110 millions going in there and there is 145 millions going into profit and non-profit um enterprises into of the cultural sector and also um i think it's artists and there is also 10 millions going into um how would you say like this more little societies so it's one is full of um, non-professional cultural related institutions which do not work as a enterprise or a company so we we are really if we're moaning in switzerland we really do that on a very high level i understand what is um i think moose said that um lobbying is lobbying is of course a problem always was i mean in, in switzerland we're not big into lobbying in the music music cultural sector but Happily, we had some structures like the we have um, Petsy, which is an indie organization of the indie venues, or we have the SMPA, which is the big it's the big venues and organizers, more on the, the profit side, not the indies. And we we really started quite early to um, to start communicate together to organize ourselves because we feared we feared the government. Is going to completely forget about us. At the beginning, it was always talking about the economy, the economy, the economy. That yeah. means everything. But normally, always fear like culture. They don't think we're economy. No. We're like we're something that's not important. We're definitely not system relevant. It's culture. Yeah. If you yeah. don't, it's something don't, we can, but it's that. Yeah, and they don't really see the, the money that comes in, right? When it's actually a massive big part of the economy, right? The nightclub economy is huge. And, right. You know, people love going, you know, people are always going to want to go out and are all, or, you know, whether it be live entertainment or anything. I mean, Mark, from a, from a UK perspective, I mean, obviously I'm really aware of what the governments have been offering over here, but uh, uh, is what they're doing enough to help those people that work within the grassroots venues? I mean, Obviously, you're going to lobby and they've been doing all the crowdfunders. I know that my local venue has been, you know, doing all that. Has that been enough? I mean, we've also seen a lot of diversification in trying to, you know, create a revenue stream. Um, you know, what, 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 what are your thoughts on that around what the government have done, what they could have done and how the venues have kind of coped with that lack of income? Yeah, I mean, uh, it was all general stuff. That's the main the main thing to understand that they didn't do anything specific to the music sector. It was it was very much um, as Cathy just described there in Switzerland. Um, we calculated that the total amount of support that was given to the sector 
as a result of those general measures was actually 35 million pounds, which sounds like quite a lot of money between March and the end of June. Uh, but the, the fact is that um, in that period, the sector lost 48 million pounds. So we're 13 million pounds in debt by the time we get to, well, by the, actually by the time we got to the 31st of May. So we have our Save Our Venues campaign, um, uh, which is basically crowdfunding for venues. We also have a central pot. We've had some good responses from the music industry to that. So, you know, um, Amazon Music put some money into there. Beggars Group put some money in, Sony, Warners. Um, and we've used that to try and prevent venue closures, the loss of the physical infrastructure. On your specific question, Sarah, um, as we know, in our particular sector, a lot of the work is temporary. It's part timers. People hold more than one job. They've got a portfolio career. So what we've seen is an awful lot of people that fell between the gaps of the government support. Um, so Music Penny Trust has start making um, some personal hardship payments out to those people using that central fund. We've got very active community. So we've got a lot of uh, venues that are running successful crowdfunding campaigns. But I'm, without sounding like a broken record, what we're really going to need is we're going to need a sector specific support package exactly like Carsten's got. Um, funnily enough, I can tell you that the, the amounts that we're looking at um, are almost exactly in that ballpark. <laughs> um, be interesting to know from Carsten how long that's intended to last for, um, because I can see Mike Nuttles just asked about revs and, and social distancing, which I'm sure we'll get on to. But yeah. the question is, how long how long will we need to be closed for? And that indicates the amount of money that we need. Yeah. I mean, go, go, I mean, Carsten, how look to answer Mark's question, how are, have you been given a time frame on how long that money is going to last for? I mean, they, they, there's something agreeing uh, that it should last uh, till the end of 21, 20, uh, uh, 2021. Um, from my point of view, uh, we, the money is gone in 12 months, I guess. Yeah. So, um, and uh, without uh, putting on uh, fur further action to bring back business to our places, there won't be no perspective at all. So I guess that uh, what we have to do with the money is to try to get different business models, uh, try to get uh, um, programs with limited seats. So we have this funny situation. It will be limited program available, 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 what a word. Uh, and, uh, limited avails, limited uh, seats leads to higher prices, double shows and stuff like that. And uh, probably we go outside of the clubs to, to get more seats and stuff. Uh, and uh, define some more additive kind of uh, dynamic price systems and and and, and uh, selling tickets with uh, headphones and 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 uh, paper stream kind of things. So this is what what has to happen because I don't believe that uh, this crisis is over. Um, it, it will take at least three years to come back to normal business, uh, and this is probably optimistic. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go we're gonna get on to um, how we get out of this and what the future looks like in in, in just a short while. Just to say to everyone that is watching and, and listening, if you have got any questions, just fire them into um, however you're watching them, and we will pick them up. I'm gonna make sure that we've got quite a bit of time at the end to cover questions because I know that there'll be quite a few for the panel. Um, I just wanted to move move on to Moose um, to quickly just because you know again with your government you've not got much support. Um, there doesn't look to be anything, especially with the current situation um as it is how are how are your venues operating at the moment are they you know are, are they able to get any kind of income streams are they diversifying anyway um you know i got i got i gotta say um you know listening to everyone else speak and it's it's different because i i read the articles and so i see these um these these things that are being passed and these rescue funds that are being passed and it's 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 amazing and rewarding and and wholly depressing from an american perspective um, be, because, uh, you know, though we are fighting for similar um, uh, programs, it's, it, you, you know, I think that um, it, it's, it's, like, it's like on one hand, you want it to give us hope because we want to be able to aspire towards programs uh, like, like what you're talking about. And on the other hand, it's, it's like culturally speaking, we just don't have a track record of doing this. I think in some ways, uh, this might be uh, a potential asset uh, as we are having these conversations with the um, with the government because we as as a community 
have not come to them for help in the past. We're not used to knocking on their door and saying, you know, this is where we need your your assistance or this is where we need funding. And um, and so maybe because of that, uh, as we are coming to them, we maybe have a better chance of being able to, to, to get their ear and to get their consideration uh, than other organizations that um, find themselves in similar financial positions. Um, you, you know, we're currently in the programs that exist right now, uh, you, you know, everything is in one way or another a, a modified loan, forgivable or, 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 or not. It's still uh, some type of modified loan. And what we're uh, working on and endorsing are programs that would at least give us a uh, longer runway and be able to address the actual um, uh, business makeup of how venues are run. I, I mean, you know, for us, uh, the discussions we're having on our side is in, in a best case scenario, it's going to be 18 months until we're able to see um, the pretense of business as usual. And uh, yes, it will, it will certainly be years until there's an, an, any, any form of recovery. But, um, you know, I had a conversation with Mark when uh, this all started and Mark told me the uh, number of venues that were in, um, in risk of closure. And we had conversations with people regionally in the U.S. and they told us the numbers and they were all hovering around, you know, 90 percent of these venues are gone for good in six months. And that just seemed it, it just seemed uh, absurd. And then we did our own research and found out the exact same thing. And, uh, and that half of them didn't even have six months uh, to, to be able to get to. And so though, though I feel that we're being very productive and though I feel that we're making headway without that solution in place and without um, you know, money hitting bank accounts, uh, it, 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 it's the question of will it be soon enough, whatever the it is that, that we yeah. hope still comes. And, and I think that that's, that's a, um, you know, our, our first letter that we sent to Congress was we're, we are not people that ask for help. Our very nature is to do it independently. Our very nature is that we've been able to uh, survive and grow throughout the, um, the, the, the issues that have come in the past and, um, and effectively compete with each other. That's kind of the American way, but that's not the marketplace that exists right now. And if we can't, if we can't get assistance to make it through this time period, um, the marketplace is going to, to shift in a significant way. And I'm not just talking about uh, fewer venues. It's, it's gonna be less competitive. It's going to be um, uh, uh, more difficult for the younger artists, for the newer artists. It's going to be the, 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 the type of thing that changes offers and um, you know is, makes routing more difficult especially for artists that aren't from the, the U.S. I mean, that's yeah. going to be even more difficult for bands just trying to, you know, take a chance on their first tour. Yeah, it's absolutely, you know, it, this is, you know, it's absolutely vital that we all get together and we try and, you know, do what we can to save these venues, where, whichever country we are in whichever territory, because they're, you know, as we said at the beginning, they're just, you know, for the, the whole ecosystem, they're, you know, they're absolutely necessary. So I can see that quite a lot of the um, questions that are coming up are looking towards the future. So we're going to, jump ahead and kind of look at what at what does the future um look like so you know how how do we open these venues up when there possibly are going to be restrictions in place and social distancing and you know does that even fit in with what kind of live entertainment and live music and is supposed to be i mean i know i know that when i go out you know all you know the best part of the evening is having you know a cheeky you know drink or you know, whatever with someone and, and, and meeting someone and having a random chat with someone that you've never met. So, you know, and can you have those moments and, and capture that escapism that people have um, with wanting to go out when you have to stay two metres apart or you can only have five people in a room? Um, so, Katie, I think if we just come, if we come over to, to, to you first, because you and I were having a conversation about this the other day, I mean, and you're, you're, you're in Switzerland, they're slowly reopening. What, what does it look like to, to you and to, to your venue? You're on mute, Katie. So here I am. Yes, we are in the pro Switzerland is in the process to. Well, we had a first step of reopening, which was with restaurants, um, meaning restaurants can reopen again. That was what three weeks ago. Four people at a table maximum, one meter in between. 
So from the government since last week, last Wednesday, it's like one week ago, we know also um, um, happenings up to 300 people could happen again. Um, the government is very vague on the restrictions. Um, they, I think the strategy is to um, um, put, put the put it up on the people to be uh, wait. I quick have to see for the answerungsvoll. Um, So we could reopen again. The responsibility is actually completely to us. It means up to 300 people. So you either have a concept where you can have the uh, social distancing. That means two meter. That's what be what four square meters per person. Um, or you also could do it without the social distancing. That means the government wants you to have um, the the names and telephone numbers of the people being in the room um, to take down because in, in case of an infection, they want to go back to tracking. That's something they stopped over the last months. And there is, of course, the risk to, if you open your room and you have one week later, it happens, you find out there was one, one person infected with the virus, that means the other 299 people are going to be um, in quarantine for the next two weeks. And it's up to the responsibility of the organizer. So at the moment, um, some, ve some venues in Switzerland, or at least in my city, but I think it's the whole, over the whole country as much as I hear by talking to colleagues, is um, some of them are opening, some of them are still trying to find out if they do. It's a bit the same with us. Um, we are in the process at our venue to... Should we open? Shouldn't we not? I mean, if we open, it's definitely with the four square meter rule. That's not going to happen. We're going to have we're going to end up with what eighty people. Then that's definitely a minus. Yeah. Um, and the idea is not that the people work for free and we can't pay the artists. It's not. It's not the right moment to do it's that. Not, <laughs> it's not financially viable. I mean, I know Louis, you and I were talking in earlier today about some of the the thoughts that you've been having about um the the any, any ways of reopening what what are your thoughts on what's happening in spain and what you can do with venues to make it financially viable for these smaller venues to open right um, is it the lyrics is that louis yeah uh well uh, i think um uh I would like to think that, that this is a temporary and exceptional situation uh, that uh, uh, we have to think uh, about uh, how to survive in the immediate, immediate uh, future, but, but not in the long term. Uh, I, I like to think that in the long term, we, we will recover the, the real normality because uh, uh, live music is a cultural activity as well as a social one. And, and and it should be so. Uh, so we cannot apply social distancing parameters to a merely social activity. Uh, 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 first of all, because uh, social distancing is an oxymoron. It's, it should be on social distance because uh, social and distance uh, don't fit. So uh, we, we, we need the proximity of public, uh, uh, the, that, that energy that, that comes from the union of people singing, dancing, screaming and hugging and, and and interacting with uh, the artist, and 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 this is a part of live music that, in my opinion, we we should not and cannot give it up. So uh, to to think about in opening with uh, a percentage of capacity with uh, two meters uh, distance, no, I think I think uh, uh, we cannot open in these conditions. We should resist until uh, we, sh we could open with a minimum for more than uh, 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 60 or 70% capacity, uh, but, but never less than that. Uh, not only for, a, for an economic and, and uh, sustainable things, uh, because live music is, is social uh, activity too. And we, we, we cannot give up uh, this, this kind of activity. 
no, not at all. And then, and Carsten, I know that you again. We were we were chatting about a few of the ideas that you'd had. Um, I mean, somebody's just mentioned um, the matinee shows and doing um, in the in in the viewing public has mentioned matinee shows and doing two two shows. I think it was you and I that were having a chat about that and how that could possibly work. Is that something that you think that could be implemented and be successful? Yeah, I think uh, it it used to be in the seventies. Uh, it used to be normal that you have shows. Uh, four, five, six, seven sets. When the Beatles started in Hamburg, they, they played 30 minutes eight times or something, and it was uh, for entertaining and not for presentation of uh, um, art. And so I think, of course, it's a, it's, it's a big step into the into the future in the moment uh, on, on, on so many different levels. And uh, if, we, if, we, if we all think that we return to a kind of normality, then I don't think that we know what kind of normality we will have in the future. So I think it's uh, it's coming back to the to the very basic things for grassroots clubs. So we need somebody to pay our rent. We need somebody to to, to pay our electricity and the heating. We need somebody to pay the Wi-Fi and then start programming and then use the space as much you can. I mean, it, it's not just in terms of uh, open your club for two hours in the night or four hours in the night. You have 24 hours of, of programming probably it's a 24 hours spot probably you need the spaces outside of your club and uh, no more cars in front of your door but make stages uh, instead of parking lots and stuff like that and and of course uh, I, I have this picture of uh, Manchester United so they've got uh, 100,000 of supporters why shouldn't a grassroots venue have uh, a thousand supporters paying uh, 20 bucks per month uh, just to get the chance to buy the ticket the first and uh, like the football clubs are doing it for centuries already. So when there's limited shows, when there's limited seats, then double the shows. Uh, we cannot uh, double the seats in the moment, but there will be definitely some different rules. But uh, th there will be a change in, in, in the way our, our, our club shows will, will be handled within the next years. And I'm not sure if it comes back to this kind of headbanging stuff we had for the last 20 years. But as I'm with the with the grassroots uh, thing I started in the, in the, in the late 70s, I've had so many different kinds of uh, rock and roll been living, been, had been lived in, in, in music clubs with so many different styles, so many changes in between that I think that we, we are the ones to, to find out how it works and the other, uh, the other parts of music industries will, will hell of hell of a thing will look how we do it, and they will find out by watching us uh, find out ourselves how we can can survive because this is what we can the best surviving because uh, as long as they pay the rent, so then everything is fine. Yeah, in innovators and and survivors definitely. Um, Mark, I know that um, you know we we chatted um, about you know how what. Um, the money and being able to adapt the venues if the you know there's a question here about you know what percentage of uk venues would be able to open if social distancing um, was had to be put in place i mean a lot of them are tiny right how would they even make that financially viable you've got several several challenges going on there all at once um uh, there's some interesting stuff coming in on the comment thing there um uh, let's start with what percentage could could open um, under the two meter physical distancing, we don't like social distancing, Lewis. Uh, we agree it should be uh, it should be physical distancing. You're still trying to be social. We're being social right now, but we're quite distant from each other. So we prefer the expression physical distancing. Um, second thing to tell you is that with the two meter physical distancing that's being imagined in the UK, we're going to say roughly two or three percent of venues would be able to be open, um, and even they are going to be hemorrhaging money trying to do that. That's to do with the layout of the venues. It's to do with the, the amount of deep cleaning that's involved. It's to do with the queuing, what people can actually do while they're in the venue, the amount of controls that you need to put in place. Um, I see in the comments there that John Platillero has just has read, is the key testing. If you knew that 1,000 people were tested and do not have the disease, why not let all 1,000 people into 1,000 cap venue? This is actually part of the, we've imagined five scenarios um, that could be the, the ways that music venues reopen. Uh, the fifth scenario is actually that they stay closed because we can't work out how to do it. Uh, the middle one that we're discussing here is the limitations. And then the, the best one, of course, is if there's a vaccine. However, there is a thing between the vaccine and the limitations, which nobody's really explored there, which John has just mentioned there, which is actually with the, the progress of science, 
and the, the restrictions that physical distancing give us, yes, it's correct to say right now that we cannot we cannot open in the way that John has just described. But that's right now. What about if in a month somebody comes up with a test that you can do in two minutes? Do we then have to really think about, well, maybe we should be opening up venues fully, but for a full capacity for people who have been tested and who can prove that through some sort of immunity passport. When I think about the timelines on physical distancing, on how long it will take before we can get back to some semblance of normality for physically distanced gigs, I think we are looking at 18 months to even two years. When I think about how we might be able to do the same if we went down the testing route, well, I can see that actually if we had a brand new test tomorrow that could be administered by, in front of the door and takes two minutes to find out the result and you just don't let anybody in who's got the virus, I can get you a full capacity gig the day after that. You know, So I think what we have to do in our sector, we have to keep all of the options open and we have to be inventive the way that Carson's just described. We have to be thinking of how can we do these physical distance gigs? How can we put some of it online? What can we do virtually? Chris Jones, I did a risk assessment on our venue, 140 seat cap, based on you cut there's no point in running a gig with nine people in it, you know, but there, there's obviously a point in running a gig in which all 140 people in Chris Jones' venues are infection free. So therefore you do not need to do all the other things. That solves the economics. If I was if I was in government, which I probably will end up being going at this rate, learning as much time about politics, that's what I'd be focused on. Testing. Yeah. Test trace. If you knew that then you, you could you could do a lot more than we're ever going to achieve with physical distancing. It's a lot um, it's a lot dependent on what on you know on medical research and being able to produce those tests and it's, you know it's very dependent on that. But I mean, when well, you mentioned streaming, then do we think that that is an option? You know, I know that you know having people in the venue, your nine people, Chris, in your venue, and then offering a streaming option out to people. Do I mean we lose that kind of live entertainment piece that we've been talking about? But do we think that's a viable option, or if if I could if I could kind of jump in on that aspect, I think that uh, you know uh, venues and promoters overall are known as being the provider of um, of of music, if you will, of of live entertainment. And uh, you know, in in today's current business model, uh, it is the, they are the provider because they have the connections and the relationships to get that performer specifically in front of a physical audience. Um, you know, we've seen how uh, uh, retail has shifted from, uh, you know, physical stores to technology companies. And if uh, we're not able to um, uh, regain some form of normalcy, uh, we will see all the progress that everybody here is talking about, about multiple income streams, go in the same direction. So though streaming is currently in addition to, um, to, to venue income, and though uh, there have been plenty of, of uh, programs that have allowed it to be in addition to what is currently being offered, I think we as, as live events uh, people should be aware of the fact that um, uh, this, this happened with iTunes and, uh, and Spotify. And uh, right now the market is ripe for us to be able to um, I wouldn't even necessarily sh say share, but potentially um, lose that sector as technology is going to advance faster um, than than what we are. And and you know, look at all the the record stores that have diversified uh, to sell um, you know T-shirts or or bric-a-brac or other things that are not just music, and see how few of those there are. Now, I don't think we're going to ever be able to replace the uh, feeling of gathering and live music. And hopefully what we're going through right now is a short-term issue. And uh, whatever comes next is going to be in addition to what we're providing. And, uh, you know, just like there's a generation that never bought something physical, there might be a generation that uh, would prefer to sit at home and watch live streams from Brazil. Uh, so whatever it is that, that we're on the cusp of going into, I think it's important, at least from um, an organizer's perspective, that we realize that at least right now, some of this stuff that we're currently hosting is because of the existing relationships. And we shouldn't be foolish enough to think that that is how it's going to continue if, um, if, if uh, you know, technology is able to ramp up in the way we've seen it do in the past. So do you mean we've got, we've got to embrace the technology and, you know, combine it with what 
with the live music aspect to, you know. Absolutely. To to I mean, like, you know, look, everybody that's doing this right now is doing it as an addition to what their current business model. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, we're seeing attempts at uh, additional revenue streams. And at least from the American side, those attempts are not equating uh, to a replacement of the revenue stream. Things like venue merch stores or fundraisers or these live streams, it's money in the door, but it's not enough to be able to, to go further. And um, you know, I think that uh, uh, we need to be smart enough as representatives of these um, organizations to realize that, that, uh, that, that goodwill that's being extended from the community um, is, uh, is because those relationships exist. And, uh, you know, two years down the road, we might look at this as the catalyst that launched a new form of consumption or that solidified the, the, the ability for this to have happened in the past. Um, but, uh, but at least right now, I, I, I don't think that we should be reconfiguring business plans in the sense of this is always going to exist as an add on. Yeah. I think the I think to pick up on Luis's point though I mean lot I mean a lot of it is about the experience and and yeah. the, the truth is you cannot fax a cat okay so so if you want to stroke a cat you're going to need one it's not going to be the same if I send you an image of a cat and it doesn't matter if you put a helmet on and I tell you that your hands are touching the cat it's not the same as having the cat and I think we got to really think about how we the mixed economy message is really important you know how can we make these things but at some point, somebody's going to want to stand in a sweaty venue and they're going to want to meet somebody that they fall in love with to the tune of a band that they just love. And we need to make sure that's protected in whatever way we can do it. Humans have been meeting to enjoy music together for hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah. I was going to go on to um, another question that we've got um, down here. So we've got, how would smaller independent bands touring international be able to do gigs in, say, after a year? Will venues be open to take such in small international bands? Um, like, what do we think about international touring and, and the ability and the speed that that's going to come back? Or do we think it is just going to be local, regional artists for, for quite a bit now? Um, Carsten, do you want to? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a very, very important thing for me. Like Hamburg uh, 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 invented itself as a music city within the last uh, 50 years. And in the moment, the most important uh, thing for the local government in Hamburg is that they definitely want to make sure that Reaper Band Festival is going to take place on the 20th of uh, September week. So this means that they're going to come up to every of our clubs and try to make damn sure that the club is still existing. Uh, they're going to come up and ask us for a, for a, for a kind of uh, strategy how we can make an international festival with... Uh, probably just local bands because I cannot see that there is any international band on tour in September. They all canceled their shows. They all canceled their tours. And Germany typically was a marketplace for all these bands. And uh, that's probably one of the reasons why we have that many clubs with, uh, with so much uh, international programming, like uh, bands from, from all over Europe, bands from the States, from all over the world. And uh, in a moment, it, it looks like as uh, if the, 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 the local artist and the national artist going to get a real, real, real big chance to develop themselves into these kind of international formats we had in, invented, at least in Hamburg. So I think that uh, um, we will see very soon uh, how a, um, um, how a, how a International festival without international artists will look like at Ripper One Festival in September. See how we can develop uh, open spaces outside of the clubs to 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 get additional audience. Uh, been been something like uh, integrated into live atmosphere as well, and then start uh, um, reinvent the kind of uh, uh, physical distance rules, as Mark uh, uh, said. In a moment, it looks like that you can sell family tables. Like if, if if they say they live together with eight people, let them stay together with eight people. So and it probably goes like that, that you can something like find out to, to get the capacity at least to 30, 40, probably 50% of your normal capacity by uh, making this important move to use the spaces outside of the club as well and uh, use spaces, uh, squares and, 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 and rooms and uh, whatsoever inside your social environment and, and around your club and make, make the, the city your, your, your stage, something like that. 
Yeah, I'm I'm really interested to see how they're gonna do Reaper Barn. I think that's gonna be quite a um starting point of what we might be looking at in the future. Um just so just moving just kind of you know looking at some of these questions and looking to wrap up. So um we've gone what what the future looks like and you know what we've what we um have been doing now. Like do it and we kind of really covered it. It's kind of like as the innovators and survivors, as Carsten says, of of the industry, um, we're constantly innovating and surviving. Is there, you know, what are the positives that have come out of this? I mean, obviously nobody ever expected this situation to ever occur, you know. And um, we went from selling, you know, millions of tickets to absolutely, you know, very limited in, in a matter of days. And um, what do we think is the positive, positive stories to come out of this, whether it be innovation or whether it be community led? Um, what do you think are the positives to come out of it? Katie, come over to you. What what would be your positive takeaway of um of of this situation if there if there are any? Oh my god, I wish you wouldn't have asked me. I'm not seeing well I think positivities is but that's happening in general. I mean communities are growing a bit tighter together. Um because of this whole social distancing, which is an awful word. I prefer physical distancing. Social distancing is really... <laughs> um, but you have communities growing more together. You, you, you've you seen some solidarity growing in music business, with musicians, with venues, um, but also general in life, like community started to organize very quick here in Switzerland. Like you go and help, let's say, vulnerable elder people you go shop for them and i hope that's maybe something positive i can see out of it um this whole crowdfunding and streaming it's well it can't be my future i i see it's what we can do for now but if that's going to be the future i mean there's going to be the club scene and live scene that's obsolete it's not we're not needed anymore are we we're going to no. need that's the venue. The future. The stuff. <laughs> so don't. Really? See, I can't see a positive thinking there at the moment. But also positive thinking is maybe to rethink possibilities, how you can do things, and also like what Moon said. I mean, that's also a positive effect. Even out of need, like independent venues started to organize themselves, which is also, also it's it's a very positive thing in general. You know, you you have. You start to do some lobbying, even if it was now out of a very urgent need. But that stuff we can take out in the future and also yeah. use for maybe more productive ideas than just surviving. Yeah, like sharing ideas rather than right. the need to do it, just doing it because it's, it's a good thing to do. Um, Moose, I know you know it's not that much positivity from from your side of it, but. Um, that, uh, there have been some great community stories, especially with what's happening over in the, the, the States at the moment. Um, what are your thoughts on the, anything positive to, to come out of the situation? Look, I, I think that my, my hesitance to, to celebrate and throw confetti in the air is because we've not yet hit that achievement that allows us to secure the, um, the, the, the future of, of these venues and promoters. So, um, but, but the, uh, we do have many things that we have done that would not have been attainable uh, prior to these circumstances, you know, there have been talks for years from very many people about how independent venues in particular uh, need their own representation, need their own organization. And um, it just hasn't come together. I mean, I remember sitting down and having a conversation of this nature maybe three weeks before uh, the venue started being shut down. And um, so we have you know, close to 2000 different venues and promoters that are now talking on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. Uh, we have a weekly call where several hundred venues are uh, and promoters are, are, are part of this call and we're able to discuss things that are relevant to um, uh, what's going on in the world right now. We um, have been able to uh, uh, I won't say necessarily turn uh, competitors into collaborators, but at least provide the platform in which uh, people that would normally be um, somewhat adversarial are all working towards the same goals. And I, I think that um, that is an absolutely huge accomplishment that, uh, that in itself is worth celebrating. 
And then of course, anything else that, that comes from this, and they're, they're, we now have the platform and we now have the organization to be able to act as a unit. And there's also, um, there's very many local and regional uh, organizations that have come out of this as well. Um, so it's not just a reaction to rezoning or sound ordinances or, um, you know, uh, 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 corporate takeovers or whatever the case might be. We're better prepared as a business sector to be able to uh, address the individual venues needs than we've ever been in the past. Which, which is great, right? So, you know, good, a nice, good positive story. And then uh, Mark? Um, no, post positives is very much in line with what Moose was saying. I mean, um, we've got a very, very strong community now. They're really looking after each other. Um, a huge reaction from the audiences, huge reaction from artists. Um, a kind of positive coming out of the negative is um, I think everybody's now starting to realize exactly what's at stake here and how much this community matters and how much our sector matters. And maybe this is an opportunity to really, really shake things up and reimagine the value of grassroots music venues, to reimagine how we respect those within our communities, but also in government. We need to look at some of our major institutions and say, are they fit for purpose when it comes to protecting the culture that we all love and care about? There seems some comments up above about the amount of money that's going into what I would describe as high art culture. Well, you know, is that where really where we want to support? Um, is that what communities care about? I think the opportunity here is to have a really progressive conversation in the whole of our society about the value of community-based music, about these centres, and I think it's really important that government is involved in that and understands exactly how important this this all is to to people. That's it. Without people, you're nothing, and 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 that's what we've got. We've got people. Yeah, no, it's great. And and, and Louis going over, uh, uh, Louis going over to to yourself. What um how what what does the immediate future look like for in Spain? And you know what what are the next steps there? Well, I don't know. I, I agree uh, with with Mark uh, about uh, the, the importance of the of the uh, grassroots venues, and maybe uh, this is an opportunity to to to, to be aware about importance. Uh, another thing I think it's important too is uh, that maybe people now is uh, aware too about. Uh, how important is uh, culture, uh, music? Because uh, a lot of people has have been uh, have been uh, confined at home, and a lot of people uh, has enjoyed uh, of m music and uh, films and uh, different ways of culture. And and maybe it's the only positive thing I can see, uh, uh, but not not too much, uh, not too much. Sorry. Yeah, um, I think I just just to um before we go into to Carson who I think has got the positive story out of this with the support that he has got. Um, I think there's just a really interesting point here for him. Why are you making him say it again? We're already feeling <laughs> terrible. <laughs> that's, why I'm, that's, why he's, that's why I'm not asking him. We oh, have... another, another positive is that everybody in this conversation is opening a music venue in Germany, so that's yeah. good for Germany. <laughs> I just wanted to but, touch on this just while we're finishing. We are running, we are running over slightly, but I do think it's important that you know it's okay the venues being ready and us being ready and we do everything like you know that I think there might be this is Charlotte that's saying it in the comments that, that you know there could be some hesitance from from the from the live music goers and from that customer base. I mean, how do we how do we communicate with you know, with the with the with the going public, that it is safe, and you know, can we make it affordable so that those that are struggling financially can actually go out? I mean, is there any thoughts that anyone's had around that about making the the public, you know, feel safe? Is anyone anyone got any ideas there, or is it just all about positive messaging and making sure that we're really clear on? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, from an American perspective, I can tell you our, our public doesn't feel safe. You can see it on the news, and that's not necessarily in related to uh, to live events. It's just in in general. Um, and uh, so I think we're dealing with multiple issues at the same time. Uh, but in terms of uh, being in one uh, enclosed environment, uh, the studies that we've seen 
um, it, it's it's not it's not a blanket answer. And certainly, some regions of the country have different feelings towards it than others. And it's uh, it's going to be a pro prolonged process. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, guys. Well, we, we've kind of um, gone over and had a great, great. I mean, we could chat for ever, right? So, um, unless is you know, but thank you all very much. Thank you everyone for for your comments in the live chat. There's been loads of questions that we not had chance to get through, um, but I'm sure that if you wanted to reach out individually to the people on the on the panel, I'm sure that they would come back to you. And you know, if there are any ticketing questions, Luke, I can see you popping up there. You um, you can message me too. All right, but thanks, guys. Have a good rest of the day, and we'll speak to some of you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.